All right, well, I will recall this uh, meeting to order. We have uh, three reports to act on today. Um, we do have a quorum, and the clerk is checking the um, attendance records to see who is entitled to vote on each of the reports. Um, and first up, we have uh, Brenda Grieca, 10 Hebert Road. So you can come right up here. Oh, yeah, already. <laughs> right where you were sitting before, yep. Oh, jeez. Um, well, you're getting set up. You want me to get the list here? Yes, please. Here's the list of folks who can vote on this one. Bob, me, Jack, Carrie, not here, Tim, Mark, Sal, Kim, Mary, Sarah, and Rosie. So if I didn't name you, then this particular one you can't vote on. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to hear from the committee that issued the report, and uh, we may have questions, and then, and then you can state your uh, opinions or thoughts about that. And I should tell you that uh, the members of the board have already read everything, so even if you don't get a lot of questions, that doesn't mean we're not paying attention or fully considering the arguments. And so the committee for uh, this one is Sarah Carter, Kim Cheney, and Mary Hooper, who would like to proceed. Shall I do it since I'm the one who wrote the report? Yeah. Okay, I'll try to. Yeah. I have hearing aids. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we all have that problem in this room, I think. Um, so as, as noted, the committee was Sarah, Kim, and myself. We visited the property and um, briefly looked in the house uh, and viewed the exterior as well as the neighborhood. Ms. Grieca's um, principal uh, reason for appealing the decision was the um, neighborhood conditions. And so we spent a good deal of time thinking about the neighborhood condition. In her uh, letter to us, she suggested three comparables, or what we understood that she was offering as three comparables on George Street. We considered those. Um, but as I said, we looked principally at the neighborhood conditions, and because she had raised that as a concern, considered the houses on either side of her. And um, sorry, I'm probably ought to look at this rather than trying to do it by memory and jumping around. Um, so the. George, in summary, the George Street properties we really didn't feel were particularly comparable to, um, to Ms. Grieca's. And um, what, and I'm not going to repeat myself, but we did, as I said, look at the two immediately adjacent. Um, one on the right hand side was remarkably similar and is valued at a higher. Um, rate than Ms. Grieca's. The one on the left-hand side actually sold recently, or sold sometime in 21, um, for $310,000, and it was assessed a little bit less than that, but significantly, 20000 almost 21000 more than Ms. Grieca's. Um, and Based on that, it seemed to us that some sort of, of consideration had been given to the um, neighborhood issue that Ms. Grieca raised. Um, I must say that upon our visit, we did not observe anything that gave us reason to be concerned. Uh, but I, I think my principal, our principal message was that, in fact, this property seemed to have been assessed at a slightly lower value than particularly the one immediately to the right, which was remarkably 
um, similar to Ms. Grieco's property. And based on that, um, we recommend that the, we didn't feel that there was enough evidence that had been presented to uh, dispute the assessor's finding, and we recommend that it be upheld. Thank you. Any questions from members of the board before we hear from Ms. Grieco? Okay. Ms. And, and oh, Jack, maybe just as a matter of explanation, we did receive, I think the whole board received the second piece of information that Ms. Greek has sent. Um, that seemed to be offering additional testimony, which was not, I mean, we, we cannot consider that because it was outside of the hearing, you know, the parameters of the hearing. So I, I, I just I wanted to acknowledge that, in fact, we received it. I certainly read it and thought about it. But at, at the end of the day, it was outside of the parameters of the hearing of what we could consider. And I would also suggest that given that the principal issue was the neighborhood, um, that, that, that our focus on properties in the immediate vicinity was, was a reason, was our response to the, the appellant raising the issue of the neighborhood. Thank you for bringing that yeah. up. And I'll, and I'll just say, as Chair, given that uh, the latest filing was not during the period when we were, we've been able to take evidence, I will exclude any consideration of factual allegations in that uh, in that filing anything that's simply her opinion of uh, of the impact is a different matter but any any new facts uh, are not considered part of the record and I apologize for that I just I did not read it thoroughly and at a glance I thought it was restatement um, but I should have looked more closely I mostly just wanted Ms. Grieco to know that we received it and, you know, what the constraints are of our process. So, so I'm hearing what's not fair. That's what I'm hearing, which I've heard before in my life. I had a brother who was murdered. The person who murdered him killed somebody when he was less than 21. So we couldn't bring that up because that doesn't matter. I'm hearing it all over again that life isn't fair. So there you go. Because I didn't do this at the right time, in the right place, nothing matters, and life doesn't fail. I went home last Saturday. You read about that. I had, to, I had a 11.30 at night. I had a car in front of my house with the lights on and the engine running with four people and a bunch of people sitting in front of it. I had to get out of my car, walk into my house, and this is not a neighborhood issue. I'm getting out and I'm like, I'm scared to death. I gotta walk in front of this car to get home, to get into my house. But somehow, everything's cool with the neighborhood. Everything's fine. And because I didn't do my paperwork on, in the right order, none of this is, is gonna matter. And I just, life's not fair. That's, that's, that's what I'm hearing. So Mary, and I, I do want to ask, how do you come up with these other houses? And what are their, what are their negative influences of the other houses? I mean, that's, can somebody just explain that to me? Of what, what are the negative influences that are shown? Because it was said that all three of the city's houses have negative influences. What are the negative influences of these other houses that you're showing me? I can answer that question if you want. Yeah. Yeah. What What's uh, so negative about all these beautiful homes you're showing me in comparison to mine with the dumpster across the street and the people I fear? The high traffic. Uh, <laughs> Ms. Greek, did you get that answer? They, they're They're located in high traffic areas, um, so that's something that someone has to consider uh -huh. when they buy it. Well, you have an external obsolescence, and they do as well. Mm -hmm. My external traffic comes from the apartments going in and out 27 times an hour. Mm -hmm. It's not road traffic. 
the road traffic of these houses is, is expected for the, where they live. It's that kind of road. It's expected to have traffic on it. My traffic doesn't, the road traffic isn't the issue. It's the parking lot traffic, in and out, in and out. Oh, it's traffic. 24 hours a day. Right. Mary, was it the opinion of the committee <clears throat> that whatever factors affected uh, the appellant's home based on activity in the neighborhood affected the two adjacent homes essentially the same? In fact, we inferred from the assessments of the two adjacent homes. Um, this was not a conversation with the assessor because it wouldn't have been appropriate, but we did feel it was appropriate to look at the two cards of the adjacent homes and to understand what the factors were, you know, what had been considered there. And both of them are assessed at a higher value th than um, Ms. Greca's. And as I said, the one on the right-hand side as you're facing the appellant's property um, was, is remarkably similar to hers. The one on the left is a different style. It's slightly larger. I think it's a larger lot. Forgive me, I'm doing this from memory. So there are reasons to for, that it would have been valued at more, but it was in fact valued at quite a bit more. So we inferred from those two cards that in fact some sort of credit or acknowledgement had been given to the relationship of the appellant's property to the property across the street. Having said that, at the time of our visit, which was a week day afternoon, um, understandably when there wouldn't have been a lot of traffic anywhere in the neighborhood, it was quiet. But it was also that the adjacent property was neat, well picked up. There was no evidence. It, again, this is just our experience upon the visit, and that's kind of the purpose of the visits, that we need to make yeah. those assessments. It's like when you bring your car to the garage and it doesn't make the noise that it's making. Not you know, I, the, the dumpster's overflowing. You could drive up there now and the dumpster's overflowing with trash. There's trash all over the place. You don't okay. see it because you're not there. When you see it, you know, you can't be there. I'm there 24 hours, you know, or a lot longer than the hour you were sitting there. Sure. I see it, you know. Any, anything from any other member of the board? Kim. I, I consider the neighborhood issues. And uh, as Mary said, when we were there, it was calm, it was orderly, it was a time of day when you wouldn't expect anything. On the other hand, I processed in my mind, did you meet this, the criteria for a private nuisance? Was there enough uh, data from what she said that I could infer there was a potential civil claim here? And I just didn't find the data that was submitted that would support such a claim. Okay. And that wasn't exactly part of our consideration. I think I was the only one that cared about that particular issue. But I wanted you to know that I didn't spit it through my head and rejected it. Okay, thanks. Can, can okay. I just ask a totally off-the-wall question? Does anybody know how many feet away from a house a dumpster has to be? <laughs> Because I, I think I do know, but I don't think that's right either, how, where that dumpster is located. Okay. Um, anything else for any other member of the board? <coughs> is there a motion? I move that we accept the committee's recommendation. I second. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you for coming in. I know it didn't go your way, but uh, I want to make sure that everyone gets a full hearing. So, and again, thank you for coming in. Well, looks like I better buy the gun. And you'll get a you'll get a mailing from from the clerk for.
set this for set this out, including what you, what rights you have to go from here. All right. Next up, we I don't want to go home again. The cars in front of my house. Next up, we have Cedar Hill. And it looks like the owner is not here. Correct. Committee was Mary, Tim, and Sal. Who would like to present this? Can you tell us who? Let me tell you. Who yeah. Okay. Um. <laughs> uh, so we presented it last. We have presented it before. But I think what would happen oh, is because we withdrew it That's and right. represented it. Yeah. You're on. Do we, do we have a copy of it? Can, can you pass out the do you want the letter? Or do you want yes. Um, it's stable on the wrong side. For those who didn't read it or don't have it. Okay. She can't read it. Read <laughs> yes. I don't think it's here. Okay. While that's going around, um, the folks who can vote on this are Jack and myself, Mark, Carrie, who is not here, Lauren, who is not here, Sal, Kim, Rosie, Tim, and Mary. Okay, thanks. What was the date of that one? The date of that was uh, October 26th. Okay. Hmm. I can double check with this. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's possible I missed some names in there. I'll go back and check against the, uh, against the video. Uh, no, Donna, you had to be there. I see you referenced to the so. Excuse me? Donna, you, you must there. have been there because I see you referenced yeah, I thought it was, I mean, yeah. information. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just you know, you're just checking You're not losing your mind. I love it. I mean, I've only missed three. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Who's the accountant? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sort of accountant. Sure. Business manager. Something like that. A guy drove up from Massachusetts. A guy from Massachusetts. Bill McNamara. He's yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll double check that against the video. But if you know you're here, one day. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. On the list. okay. Who's up? Sal. Uh, uh, yes. All right. So we submitted a draft of our um, our report and um, and Cedarville came back with a response, pointing out a number of a number of errors and suggesting that we withdraw it and uh, instead evaluate the assessment based on the criteria in the uh, in their response and um, that's what we, that's what we've done so we um, in this report we corrected a number of factual errors some inadvertent one about a parking lot that um, we described the property as having two parking lots. It actually has three that I know of, but one of them is on an adjacent lot. And we were a little bit confused about that. We, we happened to walk through that parking lot, and which is why we described it that way. So we've corrected things like that in this, um, in this uh, revised, revised report. Um, so, uh, the response had, I think, five points. We list six because we've split one of them. Let me just go through them really quickly. Um, I've mentioned the parking lots. We've, we've noted all of the incorrect and inaccurate information that was in the report. In this report, we've pointed it out at the beginning that there were errors, and then where those errors were corrected, we explained the, uh, what the error was that we had made originally. Um, uh, the second point is um, a, a reiteration of an argument that the um, 
subject property is disproportionate. This assessment is disproportionate because it's 71.6% higher than its previous assessment, whereas the overall increase in the total of all assessments in Montpelier is only 46.4% higher, and we just don't think that's a valid comparison to compare this one property to the average of all properties in Montpelier. Um, the third point was um, We, we pointed out, you know, we, we made it a point in the original draft to note that the property, property was properly listed, the acreage was properly listed at just over eight, eight acres. Uh, the appellant considered that to be incorrect uh, information or inaccurate, but that they had never claimed that the property um, was incorrectly listed. Uh, and that's that's true. They they never really did claim that. They they did. We misinterpreted a discussion late in the proposal. I actually reviewed the um, video of the of the appellant's presentation um, late in that after after the uh, appellant had made their original argument and there was some discussion going on. They mentioned that the property had the original property had been divided. Um, and in fact, we were in our packet that we received that night, and then one that, that the committee received when we visited the property was a, a map of a proposed subdivision that showed the, the correct acreage, which is in fact the acreage that has always been on the, on the list. So the error was that we, we uh, stated that it had been presented in the hearing as a mistake, and it, in fact it wasn't presented that way by the appellant. Um, just three more to go. Um, oh, um, this is a reiteration that the, the uh, appellant's list of 20 comparable properties are more appropriate um, to, the, to the ones that the uh, assessor uh, presented. We're just simply not persuaded by that argument. Most of those, well, virtually all of those properties are in other parts of Vermont. None of them is closer than about 30 miles. Um, we just think that the, um, th those properties are um, in sort of a whole different world. And in fact, um, in reviewing the video of the appellant's presentation, um, we noted that the, uh, the appellant stated at the time that the that Burlington comparables were not used because the Burlington market is quote a whole different world, um, and we agree, and we believe that's true of of many of the the other comparables on that property, um, and that the, the income approach is what's most important. We agree with that statement as well. Um, we, we, we mistakenly stated that the, um, that the appellant's um, presentation included, uh, of expenses included property taxes. It did not, that was our error. And finally, um, probably the most important um, Re rewriting is in the um, the explanation of the um, the income the income approach. Um, we we admit that that our uh, our our statement was was inaccurate, and we in order to correct it, uh, we we consulted with the assessor. The um, the point that the appellant was making was that the 9.35 uh, cap rate uh, was too low and that we should be adding uh, a tax factor of, of 2.08, I believe, uh, to that and, and using that to um, derive the assessed value. And the, in this response, the appellant stated that 
um, if in fact that e either that that 935 did not include a tax factor, or if it did, that the base rate was too low. So we consulted with the assessor and found out that the 9.35, in fact, does include the tax rate. Um, the base rate is that was used was, um, and, and this, this number was established before um, the tax rate was available. So the base rate was 7.0, and the tax factor was 2.35, which was an estimate uh, at the time. So um, it did include uh, both a base rate and a tax factor. Um, and as for its being too low, um, we noted in, in our report that we feel the market, the Montpelier rental market is very strong, the rental uh, vacancy rate of 1% or, or even a little bit less, uh, suggesting that rental property is a, a good investment and that the capitalization uh, base rate is justified. Um, and just uh, to be sure, we noted that if we had not used uh, a tax factor of 2.35 and used 2.208, the number would be lower still. So um, we conclude that the uh, property is fairly assessed. Okay. Does any member of the board have any questions? <clears throat> so I just want to confirm that um, the response that the committee is reacting to didn't present new information. It just took issue with the information that you had presented in the report and directed you back to information from the original hearing. And so all of your Reactions and corrections are based on that, not based on any new evidence. Not any new evidence. Sal did, went back and watched the tapes again and, you know. Yeah, I believe that's true. It was a, uh, the response pointed out errors, um, and we corrected those, uh, and reiterate, made some, um, reiterated some arguments about the 20 comparables and, um, and it reiterated the uh, tax, the cap rate argument that it was really the, the core of the appellant's presentation. Okay, any other thoughts or questions? Yeah, Marty. Did you guys get the response from McNamara <coughs> recently? The email from them, from Cedar Hill? I haven't, you mean a second res a response to this? Y yes. Oh, I haven't, I haven't seen that. Well, there's a response to your no, report so. with an offer to withdraw. Oh. Have you not not seen that? I haven't. Yeah, I'm I sorry. I haven't seen that. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Um. <clears throat> I did not want to see that. Was it was an offer to withdraw the appeal. Yes. Uh, yeah. And you you let me go through all of that. <laughs> <laughs> In addition to the hours, the hours that it took me to. Is if, if he was here, he would then s rebut with yes, um, an offer to withdraw if um, if an assessment of 2.945. Oh, I see. Oh, oh he was oh, over. Oh, oh, he was Yes. Uh, got it. I have, to, I have to give you the information. Um, it's a difference of $189,900. Um, it would be a decrease in his tax load. Um, by four thousand one hundred ninety-two dollars off the tax the tax roll, um, and that would represent a seventeen percent increase from when he, when they purchased the property in two thousand five to that number. Um, they are currently at a twenty-five percent increase from their purchase in two thousand five till now. I will present the information to you. You do with it what you want. Um, that was their offer in order to avoid the next the next step. I'm pretty confident in what we have. Did, did he offer any reason for a um, different number? He used he, he used what he claimed was his actual NOI, his net operating income of um, two. Hang on one second. Was that uh, the original presentation? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the two seventy five four zero two, the actual NOI from twenty two, um, with the city's cap rate of nine point three five. Hmm. We 
Sorry, I didn't get that out to you all. I don't see the email. I know we well, discussed the decisions in detail, but for the decision. Yeah, for the group, yeah. Well, what's the process, Chair? Well, I think the process is we have a, we have a report. Um, we have uh, this response that is essentially an offer to compromise the, uh, the appeal. Um, well, let me point out. Let me point out that the the income approach that that the assessor used using the 9.35 uh, resulted in a property value of something like 3.7 or 3.6 million dollars, and the assessed value is 3.134. So there's a reduction of well over $500,000 that's already been made based on the straight income approach. So, and that, that, that evidence was produced at the <coughs> initial hearing as well. So yes, Don, I know. It would be in order. All right, any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? We've accepted the report. Thank you. Boy, yeah. <laughs> oh, do you really? <laughs> All right. Last but not least, we have National Life tonight. Yeah. We have uh, yeah. a report from the committee. <laughs> <clears throat> composed of Sal Alfano, Donna Bate, Sarah Carter, Kim Cheney, and Bob Gross, and a response from Scott Rogers for National Life. Did everybody get see the response? I do have paper copies. on November 20th, the premise, as all described here, about the five-story office complex, the parking garage, plus several smaller buildings on the 239.51 acres, there was no dispute between the appellant and the lister on their income or the size or condition of the buildings or other significant physical features. And I'm just going to read uh, the base points, which cover all the ones that were discussed under, under the section of discussion. And the first one was the exclusion of property tax from the allowable expense is consistent. Oh, Sal, you used that word. Al, <laughs> we're Lord Tom? Delora. thank you. See, I had some editing help. <laughs> tax assessment practice for commercial properties. The property taxes are recognized through the use of a tax factor as a component of the cap rate to calculate the appraised value. And this is a point we just disagree on when I read their uh, response. Can you read? The building being not fully, fully utilized because many workers have been allowed to work remote, we did not feel was relevant to the appraised value. And in their comments, they still do. Uh, number three, the low cap rate was used because the office complex is, one, out of the FUD plane. It is fully rented with long-term leases, and the location is desirable. Com and number four, comparison with office buildings in rural areas is more reliable and appropriate than comparables in large cities as presented by the appellant. 
the appraiser for the city did make comments about comparables uh, at his presentation, although they're not noted in the analysis report here. Number five, the average expense ratio of 55, which is my mistake, it should have been 51, which they corrected, used by the appraiser, is more reasonable than the unusually high expense ratio of 68.5 presented by the appellant. Six, these factors are consistent with a property tax appraisal, which is different from an appraisal for selling a property. We still feel that the city appraiser did a fair market value, but the approach is different. That's all we have to say. Okay. Do we have any questions for, from members of the board or other members of the committee before we hear from the appellant? I have one question. Uh-huh. Um, Marty, your expert had a range of value, and he said that's just an opinion and you picked the higher value. Can you explain why you picked the fifth? Can't remember the exact number. Fifty-four thousand instead of. Uh, it started at sixty-six million, and after um, um, National Life had given the appraisal, he lowered his opinion to fifty-five million um, based on some of the information that was in the appraisal provided by um, Joseph Blake. Do you know what information that was? I mean, his testimony said there was a range. Um, I don't have it firmly in mind, but about ten million dollars. Um, he was basing that on, I believe, the cap. The he was changing the cap rate. I think. I'm not sure. I don't have his notes here in front of me. With a quote of what he said, it, he actually thinks expects, expenses should be between 51 and 55. But taking everything into account, he believes the real value to be between the 55 million and the 55.4. But taking everything in consideration, using the cap rate of nine, and it goes on anyway. So it's a pretty so, narrow range. You're talking about a $400,000 spread? Oh. Yes, but he, he felt he was coming down from the 66 that was there. Okay. Yep. Rosie. So I just want to clarify, Donna, you just said um, when you were going through the report that on number five, the written report we have says uh, the average expense ratio of 55% was used, and you, when you were speaking just now, you said you would change that to 51%? Right. And that's the, that's the number we picked up here that's on his analysis sheet. So it was this number, the 55. His is actually 55,482,000, and he had rounded it off in his actual. Oh, maybe I'm looking at the wrong thing. I'm looking at where you say 55% on number five. Yes. You're saying 55 million. This has to do with 55 and 51, the ratio for expenses. Okay. I, that so was right I first typed time. in, but, but the number that we felt the value was very solid of the 55.4. Two different things, Two both different. using the, the numerals 5.5. Five. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. All right. Just, See? just to make but it easy to understand. If we, are, if we were to adopt this report, we would want to make sure that the motion to adopt it uh, as a 51% is amend, amends the report to read 51% there instead of 55%. Yep. Okay. Any other comments or questions from the board before we hear from the appellant? Yeah, I just have one copy. I don't think our report deals adequately with the problem of. of people no longer wanting to come to work in offices. I think um, I'm not going to change my opinion in the value, but I think our report, I thought it was a serious argument because commercial real estate is being affected by people's view of society and how they want to live. Um, I think a better argument for not paying attention to that is the long-term lease, 
with national life I have as, as with the state. And uh, as I understood it, it was an eight-year lease. Um, so that kind of takes out the issue of that they were raising, I thought. And we were told that the National Life CEO was actively, as a businessman, are trying to get people to come back and to work there. And I know that is a common and commercial uh, real estate. So I think that's very much up in the air. And it was a tantalizing argument to me, but I rejected it as did the committee. And we don't know what the can, state of the world is going to be when they're up considering renewing the lease in years. Well, in yeah, future. but if you got eight years solid rent. Yep. Donna. Well, we also have had some ideas that they could rent to, to more than just office people. Mm -hmm. I mean, they can be really creative. Um, we can talk, Scott, if you want to share some of those ideas. I mean, really. Um, well, we did, we did discuss, can we... <clears throat> I mean, even in the interim of the city getting City Hall up, there's a possibility of having the city's rent some space. You know, I mean, there's all sorts of opportunity. I, my vote to support this is because I know there's another more sophisticated process <laughs> that, Mary. that the city can follow. Oh, Bob then Mary, sir. Yeah, I mean... When we look at the fair market value of a willing buyer and seller, we don't know what another buyer would do. They may use the property differently. They may have employees come in. They may not. That's nothing that should have a real effect at this point. Okay. Thanks, Mary. I, I, thank you. And I, same point, maybe different way than what Bob was saying, but I want to be careful about speculating about what could be done or how this could be managed differently. And I think we need to just consider the facts in front of me. And yes, I understand the issue with occupancy of commercial real estate, um, but I am persuaded by the length of the lease that um, National Life has on that property with the state of Vermont. Um, you know, maybe in a few years it will be a good argument for them to bring to us in the future. But given the facts that are have been presented to us, I. Um, the, the report of the committee makes sense to me. <coughs> Okay, thanks. Yeah, Rosie. So I have a, just a procedural question, which we haven't really dealt with so far. So um, when we accept the, if, if we are to accept the committee's report, um, if there is a future legal challenge, the report is, we're, we're accepting the report on behalf, and, and then that becomes the BCA's report. So mm -hmm. I am persuaded by what Kim said that it would be, that's that's an important factor to me that this they did make an argument about um, in general there being less uh, that, that properties are less desirable because of work from home but in this case there is this long-term lease um, that that seems very relevant to me and, and um, I would like to see that incorporated into this report it's here it's on it number is. two mm -hmm. uh, th uh, no. Three, three, but about three. the low cap rate. Mm -hmm. And that's why we said the low cap Fully rented with long-term leases. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I guess my, my question is, is it worth doing a little bit of amending to number two to kind of incorporate that there? Um, or is our discussion here enough for the record? I, if they appeal, they start all over. It's, I think it's a de novo it's review. Yeah. Okay. So what's, yeah. what's appealed from is... The decision, which is your assessment is X, and they appeal, and wherever they go, it's a de novo appeal, okay. yeah. as I understand. They do review the materials, and I'm not sure exactly what they do with them, but it is either direction you go to the Division of Evaluation or to the Superior Court, it's de novo. 
All right, let's uh, let's give you guys a chance to be heard. Would you like us to sit here and talk to you, or do you want us to come up to the table? Because we're happy to. I think you'll hear from a few people tonight. Why, why, don't, you, why don't you just stay there so you don't need to be, be popping up and down? Okay, thank Will you. Will the mics pick you up? Oh, the mics. Hang on. Pick you up. Will the mics pick you up? Not very well. Yeah. Okay. Come, come on, on up. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I'll I will catch. Start with a quick introduction, and I, won't, I promise that won't take too long. And then people who can really address uh, the uh, details of the memo that we submitted uh, are here tonight to talk to you as well. Um, once again, I'm Frank von Turkovich. I'm an uh, outside lawyer uh, working on this for National Life. Um, I, I can tell from the proceedings tonight that the board understands that that there is a presumption in favor of the number that's first offered by the uh, the listers or the assessor in this case Montpelier as an assessor but then it's uh, uh, up to the property owner to offer information credible information that would make the board consider that that presumption is now uh, uh, over it that it's vanished uh, that it's uh, no longer in effect and, and we're on an even playing field because tonight's discussion isn't a uh, a dispute or a disagreement between the uh, property owner and the city of Montpelier. It's between the property owner's uh, understanding of value of its property and the assessor's explanation of what it he believes the value of the property is. So uh, what's interesting to me tonight and what I'd like to say before our, my colleagues speak to this is that I think that the board, because of that presumption and the, and the presumption now being hopefully overcome, if you agree that we've offered enough with the Blake appraisal to get past that, I guess I'd have to ask you if if you were um, coming to Montpelier and looking for uh, office space and you needed a lot of office space and you say, wow, here's a big facility up here on the hill, it looks good, it'll fit our needs, would you... Uh, if you were a prudent buyer, would you just go to the city records and look at the assessment and say, oh, it's, the assessor says it's $66 million or $60, $60 million or $56 million as it's changed to? Uh, or would you say, I think we should get a third party appraisal and find out what uh, a current market value is for this property? I, I think that most people in that position would, would hire an appraisal, an appraiser and go through the process that it takes to rigorously look at the market, find comparables that are truly uh, relevant to the property, and then do that kind of rigorous analysis before you would make a decision like that. We have done that. We have hired the Joseph Blake Company to, uh, to produce an appraisal that is a, it's an MAI appraisal. It's a industry compliant uh, piece of work that really should carry a lot of weight, I hope, with, with the board tonight, and I, and I think it will under any other review. So knowing that and knowing that we're here tonight to try to uh, have one last chance to talk to you about this before you make a decision, I, I would hope that we could focus on some of these key components like the cap rates and, the, and what's being considered a, an expense here and, and, and try to get a little closer to each other than we are tonight because the Blake appraisal's $36.7 million number is really something that we think is supportable. And I'm really surprised that the BCA uh, hasn't moved closer to that and all, with all the information that it's had uh, to work with for the past month. So if you'll give us a few minutes tonight to, to talk to you about those things, maybe we can try to get this conversation to be, um, maybe we can try to get closer to each other. If we could settle this tonight or soon after, we'd like to do that. Great. So your your so witnesses. So I will let so uh, I'd say Mark and Scott you should come yeah, up and come up together and work our way through this. Mark's like the play-by-play -play guy, and <laughs> color commentary <laughs> announcer. Thank you again for your time this evening. Um, I think. It would make sense to start right with the, the $55 million value and kind of unpack 
Yeah, probably for the. Oh, I'm sorry. Mark Overady, I'm the director of real estate management with the National Life Group. I'm Scott Rogers, the head of facilities for National Life. And I'm not having you swear in because you're not presenting any evidence. No, no. Also the same meeting. Yep. So, from my understanding, I believe the $55 million was at the, the consultant's handout, and it was a cap rate of, of 8% um, plus the tax load and using a 51% expense ratio. When he developed the 51% expense ratio, he used the taxes of $792,000, which equates to about a $36 million value if you just divide that by the tax rate. How can you have a $55 million value when you're only using $792,000 for taxes? Because at $55 million, the taxes are about $1.3 million. So if you're going to use a 51% expense ratio, you got to know what's in there. And our tax is at $60 million, whatever, or 16.5% of effective gross income. Using expense ratios are not the way to do it. It's individual expenses. Analyze them individually, not blanket them. Because again, the taxes are 16.5% at our current tax load. And the consultant himself used $792,000. It's right in his work. So if he's going to value the property using $792,000, why is our assessment $55 million, not $38 million, as he's suggesting right here? It's uh, page one all the way down at the bottom. Um, process question, Jack. Hmm. The appraiser was at that meeting, and they exchanged. And so now we're re-evaluating the appraisal's test. We never had an opportunity to look at this until that night. Okay. We're hearing commentary on the Okay, I'm, I, just on the commentary evidence. and new evidence. Okay. Yeah, it's, I think it's commentary okay. on, on the evidence. You know, uh, it's, it's in our, our memo that we provided. Um, and we can use the cap rate as well, where the appraiser consultant that we hired, Joseph J. Blake, they extracted all the sales from the market, um, which is customary and appropriate, and analyzed them um, and, and came up with a 9% cap rate, which is reasonable. Um, the city's consultant used 8% with no supporting data. He, I don't know where he came up with his 8%. But I do know if you were financing this property and you were looking at a 20-year amortization at 7%, you know, an 8% cap rate would provide you about 4% return on your, your money. That's not enough to attract an investor because you'd have to put at $55 million, you'd be putting about $14 million of your own money down, tying it up, and there's only eight years left. We're, all, we're talking about eight years as being a long-term lease, and we're talking about the lease, but we're never looking at the lease's expenses. We're just saying we're just brushing over, calling 51% reasonable. That's not reasonable. Um, if you do the cap rate at 9%, if you're going to put down $14 million of your money, again, same terms, that provides you with an 8.1% return to your money, almost double. It makes a big difference. You can't just, on a whim, select a number without any market support. Again, the Joseph J. Blake, all his, all his cap rates were abstracted from sales of similar scale, similar income characteristics, and they're all within the last year. That's relevant market data. It's not selected out of nowhere. So this is all very important uh, data when, when providing a credible value opinion. And it makes a huge difference when you move that number around. Huge difference. Can I yeah. ask you a question? You said they're all within the last year. Were they before April 1st? I don't well, I know. They're in, they're in the, report, the, the appraisal report. I can tell you the page. It could be within the last 15 months, 16 months. But I just found it really interesting, having had the opportunity to, to digest the handout that was provided to us, when the consultant themselves are saying that $792,000 is a reasonable taxes. And that equates you just divide by the 0 .202, 0 0.2208, and you come up with about $36 million for the property. His number is not mine. 
Scott, did you want to make any points? Well, I think I'd like to um, step through our responses to the six findings really quickly, if I could. Um, and I just want to be clear on the first one. We're not we're not disagreeing that using a tax factor as a component of cap rate to calculate an appraisal value is appropriate. We agree with that. It just has to be done correctly. Um, and the city's consultant failed to do that because they failed to account for the actual terms of the lease with the state of Vermont. Do you want me to comment on that? Yes. Okay. So when Joseph J. Blake forecasted the revenue for the state of, for the national life, the owner occupied portion of the of the uh, income, he recovered the expenses, the recovered the tax expenses. When the consultant forecast the income or he, he just reused the income, he never accounted for that 62% of the tax is being recovered, so it's already baked in the income. So when you take that out and you value the property, it comes out right, right in line because he never took the taxes back out. You can't recover an expense that you're not charging for. And, and we do not charge the state uh, to recover our expenses. They have a gross lease and not a triple net lease. And that, that is a meaningful error on the part of the city's consultant. That, that error is carried forward because the income side of the house was never adjusted for throughout. Uh, number two, the building not being fully utilized because many workers have been allowed to work remotely is not relevant to the appraisal value. And I think you touched on that a little earlier, Kim. Um, we believe that's absolutely false. Um, the values of commercial real estates are going down everywhere right now because nobody wants to be, and, and I'm being a little broad when I say nobody wants to be in the office. I want to be in the office. I kind of like it. Um, but there are a lot of people that want to work from home and have since the pandemic, and that results in landlords not being able to lease space, which impacts value. Um, the other thing, you know, I, I can't remember in the previous testimony if we told you a little bit more about Mark's job, but he works on leases all across the country. And he works with uh, agents that sell our policies, that sell national life policies. And they enter into mostly, you know, four, five, six, seven year leases. And those are actually considered short term leases in the commercial industry. So with about seven, a little over seven and a half years left on the state lease, that's absolutely not considered a long term lease at this point. Especially for underwriting. Okay. Uh, the low cap rate, uh, and I, we talked about that a little bit, Mark did a minute ago, but um, the thing that was confusing here is the city's consultant used a range of cap rates. So on the property cards, anywhere from 7.2 to 7.9%, and in the handout that we got at the last hearing, it was 8%. Um, those all deviate from each other, but they also deviate from um, the Joseph J. Blake appraisal, which was based on actual market data, what's really going on in the market. Um, so that's just that's one more way that the city's consultant didn't account for what's going on in the market. Under number four, um, comparison with office buildings, sales in rural areas is more reliable and appropriate than the comps in large cities presented by the appellant. Uh, the city's consultant didn't do any independent research. And they didn't provide any comps. They did use uh, some of the data from the Joseph J. Blake appraisal that we provided, um, which suggests that they found the comps used by Blake reliable. Can I make a comment? Yes, please, please Scott. Um, in the PVR guidelines, too, and I know that differs from USPAP, um, where it's obviously just a little bit different from what Kevin's bound to, which is USPAP, um, and the PVR guidelines are a little different, but they always they all say that if you're going to admit, a, admit an approach to value, you have to explain why. Um, and I don't felt I don't feel like that there was an adequate explanation provided by the consultant on why they omitted the sales approach. And I'll say just because there are no local sales doesn't mean the approach is not valid. It's very valid. It means you have to expand your search. Perhaps he wasn't capable of that. It just diminishes your credibility when you don't process an approach. We wanted Kevin to focus on similar sales, um, and he did. He scoured the entire country looking for sales that are that are in the similar type locations. They're not everywhere, and, it, and they have to transact in order for us to use them as well. So he, he gathered the best data possible throughout the United States. But you can absolutely not omit an approach to value that is credible um, because it diminishes the entire credibility of your valuation. 
and we've never been provided with a good explanation as to why. I do recommend him saying it was something like it was hard. Well, yes, it's very hard. That property is not easy to appraise. There was not a single, the two appraisers that I contacted locally wanted nothing to do with it. Um, not that they're not good appraisers, they just understood the challenges of getting the appropriate market data to provide a credible value opinion. So. Uh, under number five, it talks about uh, the average expense ratio of 55%, um, and, and we corrected and, and agreed that that's 51%, uh, but that's the um, committee felt that it was more reasonable than the high expense ratio of 68.5% uh, that we presented. Um, and again, ours is real data. We know what it takes to operate the building. Um, the city's consultant's value was based on an unsupported expense ratio forecast. Um, I mentioned this before, I'll say it again though, the city's consultant didn't take into account that our lease with the state of Vermont is fully gross. We don't true up our expenses, so we don't recover those from the city. That absolutely affects the expense ratio, and it means the city's 51% expense, expense ratio is absolutely not achievable, simply because of the terms and conditions of that lease. Can I also make a comment there? Yep. Um, I also revisited our expenses earlier today, line by line, um, and compared them to um, the Joseph J. Blake uh, appraisal, and he uses expense comparables. For each line item, he has five properties. Um, he doesn't compare the property taxes, because those are outside of Vermont. They're really tough, different municipalities, but every other expense, uh, and he forecasts within the range uh, for each line item. Um, and so that's, and that's the appropriate way to do it. It's, it's a lot more granular than, than, uh, than just blanketing it with an expense ratio. Expense ratios are fine if you have like kind leases, like an apartment building. We had that Cedar Creek. Well, that's a large apartment complex that probably has lease, leases similar to other complexes like Finney Crossing and Williston. You pay your rent, you pay your electric. A lot of apartment complexes operate very slim, similarly. But when you have leases that have differing lease terms, you know, triple net, modify gross, gross, you can't just you can't just compare the income compared to the net operating income because your expenses are completely different. The lease structures are different. It's not appropriate. The next point, I, Mark mentioned, but I think it bears repeating, uh, from the city's consultant's two-page handout, uh, he suggests that our tax expense ratio should be similar to two Vermont comparables at 8.95% and 8.91%, or approximately $792,734 of tax burden. Our current real estate tax liability is 16.5% with an actual tax expense of 1.4 million. So if you were to take our tax bill for the proposed $55.4 million assessment under the current tax rate, it would be about 1.2 million. Now, if the consultant based his numbers on 792,000, how can we end up at 1.9, uh, 1.2 million? How can the that, value be? How can the value be that? Yeah, that that just suggests that um, the consultant's opinion of value was very wrong. So, in looking at, I don't want to read all the numbers exactly. You've got the bullets in front of you, but. Um, there's also an analysis on um, tax liability uh, in terms of dollars per square foot of net, net rentable area. And uh, the two Vermont comparables were $1.87 dollars per square foot and $1.78. Um, applied to our property, it would suggest a real estate tax liability of 1.87 square feet times the 449,000 square feet of net rentable area, which gives us a tax liability of 840,000. 840. 840,000. 800 to 840. 2840, yes. So that actually lines up fairly well with the consultant's forecasted 792,000. Um, but that also results in assessments of 38 million and 36 million. So that's the range based on the consultant's numbers that the assessment should come out to using the real data. And then, and I don't know if you wanted to mention anything else. No, that's good. Um, just in closing, the, the finding six, um, you can probably tell from hearing me talk, I'm not a, uh, an appraisal specialist. That's Mark. Um, I'm a layperson. But when I read bullet six, that really, I found that shocking. 
um, for the board to state that, or for the report to state, I'm sorry, the board hasn't officially stated that yet, that um, a property tax appraisal is different from an appraisal for selling a property. That's absolutely not correct. Um, and we've quoted state statute below. I also cut and paste from the Vermont Department of Taxes website on the front um, that property is to be assessed at its fair market value, and fair market value is defined as the price which the property will bring in the market when offered for sale and purchased by another, taking into consideration all the elements of the availability of the property, its use, both potential and perspective, any functional deficiencies, and all other elements such as age and condition which combine to give a property market value. There can't be two different um, appraisals, one for property tax and one for property sale. They, they need to be the same thing. And we believe that number is $36.7 million, as stated in the Joseph J. Blake appraisal, which is supported by real market data and real expense data. Any questions or comments from any members of the board on these two witnesses? Or Kim? You said the first time you heard Mr. Krajewski was when he testified at our last hearing? Correct, sir. Yep. Is there no process for you to, in the real world, take a deposition and examine him? I don't know. This was handed out to us at the hearing. We had no prior knowledge of this, had no opportunity to digest it. No one did. Excuse me? No one did. No one did. Well, and this was our first chance to use some of that data to respond. Not in courthouses in litigation. <laughs> Actually, Kim, there was the uh, informals in May, which they attended, and the Krajewski crew were there for that. So there was, there was a chance then um, then we had a, a grievance meeting, which we didn't really talk much about that, which was here in uh, late July. Uh, but as far as that handout from, from Bill's last testimony, that was day of. He showed up right before I saw it at the same time that everyone else did. Well, these folks come in here today and say you made a lot of mistakes. And frankly, this is a report that apparently was written yesterday. I saw it three minutes ago. Uh, so I haven't had a chance to really digest it, but I, I think you're entitled to have a, each other to have a fair uh, crack at the other guy's expert and test his theory in some way. Um, the Blake one seemed to me had a serious error because your comparables are in big cities with different tax rates and your cap rate was based on the tax rate being taxes deducted from your income instead of as an add-on. So it was hard to tell what the real numbers were, but I think... Uh, I just personally think that national life has been very important in this city, and I don't think you've been treated fairly. I'm not saying we got the wrong number. <laughs> Can I comment on that, Kim? You're, you're about the Blake appraisal. Um, so when you're when you're abstracting cap rates, you take the sales price, you divide it by the uh, net operating income, and you come up with your rate. Has nothing to do with taxes. Taxes are a line item as an expense item, and basically, the investor is looking at that number, the cap rate number, to say, does this make sense as an investment with the taxes included? No one can assume they're going to be successful at a tax appeal. So you have to, when you when you're making that purchasing decision, there might be some entrepreneurial incentive in there that you might be able to lower your taxes. But you know, when you're when you're executing that purchase and sale on that property, you're only entitled to the rights within the lease contracts for that income, and you're purchasing with the expectation of income. Um, so that's why that's the important cap rate. It doesn't really, it's not really designed for to break taxes out of it. Well, I thought both parties agreed on the income of some 800. Uh, Kajeski said he used your income numbers. Uh, I believe he did in, in his in his um, analysis of the Blake appraisal, which was presented at our hearing. 
Yeah, he was he was provided a copy of, of our appraisal, and then he went through and he provided his own opinion value based on our data. A new opinion value. Yeah. And that's what caused him to lower it to 55? Correct. Yes. Donna. Uh, I just want to say that in general, though, at the hearing, the city appraiser, and I'm sorry, I mix up their last names, but the city appraiser and your home real estate appraiser had a lot of exchange about this cap and grade, so I feel there was a lot of opportunity. And at the end of that argument, unanimously, the committee felt that the city appraiser just solidly had better arguments that we could relate to and was more realistic with Vermont. And so I still stand behind what the report says. Now, uh, uh, do you have more uh, argument to present, or no. are you wrapped up? No. Okay. Does any uh, other member of the committee have any, or board have any questions of these uh, of the taxpayer? Mary. I, I don't know if I have a question, and so I'm going to give you what's spinning in my mind. Um, I'm, I, I want to have a better understanding of this argument about how the, the city's taxes should be baked into what we're considering. I'm a, I'm a little bit lost on how to think about this. I'm not, I, I'm not, I, the length of the lease is the occupancy, the um, comparables of, you know, the, the different comparables. I, it, I'm kind of done thinking about that, but I, I, I don't understand quite what is happening with the taxes. And maybe everybody else has got that straight in their mind and they're comfortable with that. I am thinking of the conversation that we had on the down street properties where there was a dispute about um, information in terms of how they came up with the assessment. I don't know if these are comparable situations and there were five folks on, no. okay. Because our the city appraiser accepted all their numbers as far as income. But baking in what the actual tax rate is, is that that's the one thing that I'm, I was hearing, is that it sounds like there was an assumption on the city side that the taxes would be seven or 800,000, sorry for not having the numbers properly, versus what they would actually be if we set the assessment at the rate that it was. That's the, at, 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 at what the assessor says it should be. And that seems like, I understand that argument. Um, and, and maybe you all considered that, and I'm just not following it. But given that it's not a triple net lease, that in fact these are expenses that they have to pay, um, it seems like that should be taken into account. or. I'm totally misunderstanding that, but that's what's churning in my mind. It's, that's that's. I, I'm sorry to muddle this, but that's what's spinning around. And I'm sorry, I don't know where there is a question on that. Well, I think it's an invitation to any other member of the board to uh, share their in, their understanding of. These concepts. Not a concern previously stated. Can I make a quick comment on your your comment about this the city appraisers in, in Vermont? The that is kind of the core of the problem right now is there is no data in Vermont for this property. You have to go outside the market to get data. There's no transactions of a half a million uh, square foot office properties to get cap rates from or sale data. There's no there's not a three hundred thousand square foot office lease comparable to compare it to. That's why you have to go outside the market. Uh, and you can't compare, the scale is just so important for this property, you can't compare a 5,000 square foot lease in downtown or a 1,500 square foot lease with a 200,000 square foot office lease. It, it, they're not comparable, there's, there's just so much more to it. 
Uh, that's why you have. To, that's why we hired Joseph J. Blake because he has. He does a ton of work in Vermont. He knows the market very, very well, but he has access to data outside the local market, which was huge in providing a credible value opinion. Okay. Um. I'm, I'm also with Mary. I'm a little bit lost on the, the tax argument, and I'm not was sure it, was, what question to ask. Was it the argument that I made earlier? So you have in your, you got a bullet in here, um, the third bullet down on the second page. Maybe you just want to explain that a little bit further. Oh, so... The, uh, the city's assessor on the property cards, they add, they don't include ta property taxes and expense, they bake them into the rate. So if you re if your reconciled rate is eight, you add the tax rate on it's 11 point something. Well, I did just the opposite because the property cards that I have here, um, I, I did the same abstraction and the initial cards that we have when we're valued at $66 million, what fell out, the reverse engineering, he actually used 7.2 and 7.9% as cap rates when the initial values came out. And then all of a sudden, he had a change, a change of heart, and he went to 8% with when he took the data from the Blake report and increased it to 8% with his handout. That's what the bullet three talks about. He spent a lot of time at the hearing explaining about that. And I couldn't, I can't tell it to you again. Yeah. But he did, as, I, as to, I just don't know. and that's why he gave us these examples of the In the 7.2, and, and, and that basically provides you a, what, 2% return on your 14 million if you were going to finance this property. Um, not, not a, I don't have $14 million lying around, so I, I'm not a buyer, but I would advise against it. <laughs> and what we were mentioning earlier, the 792 as the tax burden, that's the consultant. He's saying that the property taxes should be 792. The city's consultant? Yes, the city's consultant. Should be $792,000. It's on page one of his handout? Yeah. That's where I'm lost because okay. if we set the taxes at 55, or it, which is where we are, where yeah. our proposal. You're saying that, in fact, the taxes on that amount are over a million. 1.22. 1 1.2, yeah. not 700. Correct. And, and so I guess maybe my question for the committee is, did you consider that in, in um, coming up with what the fair number should be? Our number was all around property value. We did not dispute anything about the tax rate. It was not part of the appeal. It was not pointed out. I mean, Sal, <laughs> you no, didn't no, talk it about it. It wasn't. It wasn't. Part of that. And so it's like it's a whole new evidence piece. It's a piece. whole new. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Oh. It's about property value. But how we arrove at the property value. At the property value, right, we got the, there, it's yeah. different than the taxes on the property value. And if the only approach to value is the income approach, property taxes are a huge, huge chunk of that expense. Huge. As, as before the 55, it was 16.5% of our expenses. <coughs> That's a big number. $3.27 a square foot, and the properties in Burlington were transacting at $1.78 and $1.80 a square foot. It's a substantial difference. What are your other expenses for the state lease that aren't accounted for? Uh, all of them aren't accounted for in the state lease, so our utilities, our insurance, repairs and maintenance, oh, okay. you know, all of them. It's a fully gross lease, Kim, with no, uh, no true-ups after uh, each operating year. And those expenses were were not included in the income. Well, they're included in the income that we did. Yes, they. And the city accepted. Apparently. He put fifty one percent down. I'm not sure how that itemizes out. I don't well, know. That's true. He yeah. had the tax figure. But in the fifty five percent, the taxes are included. In the fifty one percent, the taxes are included again. At he has them in there at 8.95 to 8.91, 
the resulting value is 55 with a tax rate of with a tax bill of over 1.2 million dollars. That, that I can't draw that correlation either from the 792 to value the property, resulting in a 1.2 million dollar tax bill. So we need to come to some kind of conclusion here, and so I'm going to ask right. I don't know. If, I'm going to ask right now if someone is prepared to move to uh, pick, approve the um, committee's report. And a member of the committee may, may do that. I'll make a motion to okay. the committee's report. And is there a second? I'll second it. Okay. We get our charge. Is, is there any more discussion among the members of the board want to have? I, would, I plan to vote for this, but my reason is I think in a normal hearing with proper preparation, you're going to get a better result. I think this is very complex and very important to the city and to national life. And, uh, I think a little more examination in a different forum. That's what I'm going to vote for. Thank you. Does anybody else have anything to say? I know you're really wrestling with this, Mary. Yeah. I, 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 I'm troubled. Um, I, I, I want to support the committee because they have put the sort of deep thought into it, and I have not done that. But I have to say that I'm, I, I'm, I'm hearing this question about the differences in the taxes and how that was treated as an expense or not. And that is compelling. And I, I, I feel like maybe I'm missing, well, if, if in fact this was never raised initially, um, and this is, in fact, new information, and I guess I have to stop hearing, listening, because we're not allowed to take new testimony at this time, and that's too bad. That's the reason I was thinking about the downstreet process where we just said, can you guys just go back and try to true up your numbers a little bit and come to, you know, to see if there is a way to understand these numbers more solidly than I'm able to do that. But that that doesn't seem to be gaining some traction here. And, and again, I just want to acknowledge members of the committee, you know, have spent the time thinking about this, whereas I'm just, you know, in the past half an hour or hour am thinking about it. So therein lies my dilemma. And I guess I'd like to be persuaded that I should vote in support of this. Um, I'm just having a hard time getting there. I'm in a very similar place to Mary. <laughs> I, if, if this is new evidence, then I agree that we can't really we consider can't. it. But I, I don't, I still don't really follow it, and that makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, but I also want to defer to the work that the committee has done. Um, that's been our practice in general. Um, we trust the committee to do good work and um, so I'm, I'm feeling conflicted as well on that basis. One way to think about this which uh, is you know the, the process is very uh, the process works quite well for the ordinary <laughs> Uh, residential or business property. It's very difficult for this process to work with uh, the complicated issues we have here and uh, a lay elected board. Um, but it's also true that the burden of proof is on the appellant. And if the appellant can't make this, make it so that members of the board can understand and uh, say, yes, they're right. You know, that's, that's a factor that uh, 
we could uh, potentially consider. We just okay. flesh that out so I don't understand your conclusion. That if the appellate comes before us saying the city is wrong and they've raised a bunch of arguments that I think few of the people in this room even understand what the arguments are. And does that give the members of the board the ability to say, I agree with you, what this, the city did this wrong? Uh, when we don't even understand, when people may not even understand what the argument is. That's convincing, Jack. I'll go along with that. <laughs> you know, and I, okay, I'm, I'm not trying to convince anyone. I'm just trying to help help the th thinking process along. But thank you. But the state the state of Vermont also has this this process in place for specific properties like this National Life uh, in 2010. It ended up going to court to flush it out, and like Kim said, for more time to develop and and uh, digest all this information. Um, I think it's very important that we come to a number that everybody can agree on because the state of Vermont um, is going to start doing this reappraisals five or six years, uh, every five or six years. So I mean, it is important that we get this figured out. And I think um, at this point it's probably, you know, likely that we're going to go to the next step. Um, have everybody a chance to get together and, and, and get it worked out. That is another factor. This, is, this doesn't end tonight. How was it resolved in 2010? Um, it ended up going to Superior Court, and was there, a ruling of something? there was a ruling in the city's favor, yes. Mm. Of the current, the, the, the previous assessed value, of, I don't remember how far off they were, but it was um, significant enough to end up going to court. Harry. So this conversation about essentially how the taxes were or were not baked into the city's number versus national life's number is this is essentially it, this is new testimony is yes. that no not that we consider the tax property tax in the information it's that they're looking at the property card and the tax rate here that's what we did not consider but I think well, this I'm is not following that either now. I think this is part of the evidence that was before us and yeah. it may not have been argued before this. So it was before but us. it's evidence that was received. Yes. So can we clarify what is new evidence here because I have thoroughly Evidently confused. nothing. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I don't think I don't think properly considered anything is new evidence. I confused easily yeah. and I was following everything up until that point. Yeah. So. Like like you, you heard uh, one of the previous appellants say, talk about what happened at her house on some night after the hearing. And that was new evidence because, gotcha. and we didn't consider it. Yeah. So are, are we ready for a vote on this? Yeah. John, I don't think we ran down who can or cannot vote on this. I know that I cannot. Yeah. Really, you are the only one who cannot. I apologize, I missed the last <laughs> Aren't you lucky? <laughs> Although you might not have been here. I was here last check. week. No, I mean for National Life. I'll check. I don't think you were. Jack, can you call the question? Is that well, yeah. we're, we're getting ready to uh, yeah, have the vote. Sure we're gonna, okay. John's going to tell us who's okay. eligible to vote. We convened uh, me, Jack, Sarah, Mary, Kim, Rosie, Mary, uh, Bob, Donna, Sal. So you're out, Mark. Yeah, you don't vote. Okay. Okay. All those. The motion is to uh, to adopt the committee report. With the correction. With the correction to 51%, 51 at uh, bullet number five on the okay. second page. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Nay. With my apologies to the committee, I just personally just can't get 
get there. And okay. I apologize. Totally fair. The motion carries. And you guys will get the next step. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks for coming in. This is I appreciate all your efforts to make this comprehensible. So, um, Oh, are we going to talk about the feel of the abatement? Tim wanted to talk about abatement real quick. I want to take 10 minutes to do that. Okay, yeah, right. don't, don't still leave. Like you. Still yeah. like you. We'll still like you. I'm not sure if Tim <laughs> likes himself right now. <laughs> or he's on the board. Thank you again. Thanks, guys. Have a good holiday. Thank you. Thanks. Just what to expect. I mean, coming from a place of not knowing what to expect. I, I, I can run down what it's going to look like real quick for those of you who haven't seen it before. It is another quasi-judicial process. Folks are sworn in um, just like this, but there's no, everything's decided and decided then and there. You all got packets that sort of lay out the law, that have the law in there that give you the basic idea. The appellants will come before and make their case for an abatement, hopefully ask for a specific amount that they don't necessarily, and provide whatever supporting information they can. I always encourage them to provide as much as they can in advance so that they're not just coming there making an argument. But everything we're going to hear is on damage to property from the flood. Um, so that stuff should be fairly quantifiable. Um, and then the, the board can go into a deliberative session or then and there. Don't have to go into a deliberative session. These things have been discussed out in the open a lot, I think, when we usually do them. It just becomes a discussion then and there. Uh, decision can be made. We looked at the idea of maybe going into one deliberative session for all of them at the end of the meeting. You can do that, too. And um, one thing that was said the other night at the council meeting was that there are hard and fast rules about abatement, and that's actually the opposite. There are no hard and fast rules. You can choose to abate any amount. You can choose to, to abate uh, principal, uh, uh, penalties, interest. Um, water you can sewer. You can water that's sewer. Amazing. You can choose to abate nothing. You can't, I mean, and under any rationale you want. You could say, I don't think so. You didn't make your case. You could say, I don't think the city can afford it. You can say, I'm having a bad day and whatever. Um, don't say that, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but also point, go both directions in time. Yeah, you can, go forward. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you can, you can abate the current bill. You can also, someone could theoretically ask for an abatement from two or three years ago. If they yeah, want. you can do yeah. installments. You can do all sorts of things. Yeah, right. yeah. And what I had put out there was a discussion I had sort of working with and having conversations with the Barry City clerk who was working on some of the same sort of stuff. Um, but in your packets, there's a general guideline that's just a suggestion based on our concerns about the uh, education portion of the tax and being able to afford that. We don't necessarily have to abate an entire amount for a quarter. So I had some recommendations in there to look at it. If something's a total loss, then clearly the whole thing should be abated. That's only fair. Uh, if it's repairable or in the process of being repaired, then it might make sense simply to abate the municipal purport of the portion of that taxes rather than the whole thing. Now that whole approach could be thrown out the window if in the first couple weeks of the legislative session they um, do what they're talking about doing and, and create some support for municipalities on that education part of it so we're not on, on the hook for it. It's possible that they do that, then these guidelines through that, throughout there don't matter. Um, but there was something to think about is all. John, I have a question. Um, I, I think the dis board's discretion is great, but and I, don't, I don't have a statute in front of me. I haven't uh, gone back to review it yet, but I thought that there were some occasions in which the person is 
entitled to an abatement and they're required to be given. For instance, I think the stat doesn't the statute talk about if the property is destroyed. That was my question for the flood. Well, we destroyed have destroyed or, or buyouts. So the that flood. so that if destroyed, if you, yeah, if we you own a, the total. If you own a house and the and the house burns down, mm -hmm. as a matter of law, aren't you entitled to? I don't think so. No. I think if you read the statute, it says that that's one of the things that you, it, that if it is no longer exists, it is eligible for oh, okay. an abatement. But I don't think you're required to. Um, it's just there's a list of five or six yeah. reasons why you can abate. It's pretty standard yeah. operating yeah. procedure, too, though. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 that's not yeah. what I'm saying. But right. in terms of what the statute says, I believe it is just lists that as one of the things that okay. you can consider rather than an obligation to offer an abatement. And you all do have the statute in your we binders, too, yeah. by the Wait, way. Did you give us these binders yet? Yeah. Uh, did you not get one? Okay. last one. I have one. Okay. <laughs> uh, Donna. Well, I was just, there's so many different situations with the flood, whether you have any guidelines for a house that has done, done an agreement with FEMA is going to do a buyout. Is there any, is there any, that's one question. And the other is, is there any partial time? Is there a, a tax for the past year they pay? But after the flood, then that's abated. Uh, you know. I was keeping it very general because okay. one of the things I was advised is by VLCT was don't try to put too much restriction on the uh, on the board of abatement. You won't get to do what you want. A buyout is really sort of interesting. I just wondered if there was any so precedent. If, if we have property that's destroyed, but we still have the land there, does the land still have a value, and is there still tax on that part of the value? It's just a the question here. Arguably, yes. Well, but other than if it's been, de if it's a force demolished from FEMA's point of view, they can't sell it for anything to put a house on. I'm, I'm not talking about FEMA, okay. I'm just talking about property that, the, okay. you know, we have land value, we have property value, yep. Yep. and the property is still there. You know, yep. The house the is washed is away. <laughs> the house is washed away. The land's still there. Yeah. Someone could buy that and someone just said, oh, now there's no house on that property. I'll buy it and build a house on stilts or I'll buy it and build a house that uh, yeah. I know that's not, I know we're not talking about a FEMA buyout, Donna. I'm just talking about yeah. if it's a vacant property that could be built on, oh. yeah. there could be value. Uh, Don, uh, sorry. Uh, Rosie, then Mary. So given given that all of these are likely to be the same incident, it sounds like they are, um, I want to be really conscious of treating everybody fairly um, and not applying different standards to different people, understanding that some of them will be different situations. So I would feel much more comfortable about holding all the deliberation to the end for that reason um, so that we can apply those same standards across everyone and not be in a situation where we gave something to somebody and then as we continue to deliberate, <laughs> we change our minds and try to, you know, that it get less soft hearted. Yeah, and I, I think we should take them all at once because it is the same event. And if, John, if there are any that are not that event, oh, yeah. then we'd want to take those separately. We've got one kicking around that may or may not come in. As soon as I created all those binders, we started getting another trickle of, of interest. So I actually have some updates for your binders. Um, yeah, I mean, most of this is... Those handouts for tonight? These are for tonight. These are, if you already have a binder, and these ones, I promise you, print it on both sides. Thank you. If you already got a binder, just grab one of these, put it together, and it'll replace some of the stuff you've got and add to it. Kim, you just got one. Then I'll get you, I can get you a binder, too. And Kim, this is still for yours, because you, you picked up yours. No, I didn't. I can grab you. No, you're not.
binders. No, the, the current binders have been updated. Oh. You talked about the binder that you gave us last week. Yeah. We yes. have that. Take this. Yeah. That yeah, and that'll replace some of the, the schedule. And the one that's now. And that's all current. Before the binder that John put up, it yeah, so I would love to also talk about the remaining things for the appeal future. Um, there was some mention of maybe we would meet next week or we wait till January. I know we have a handful of outstanding reports. Yeah. We have three regular ones <laughs> and the Jacobs ones. We just have to meet the um, January 15th deadline. So, yeah. and we have and we have two if we were to let it go or that, yeah. yeah, let's wait. Until so January. right now we have two meetings. I, I did not schedule for the next two weeks because it was so close to the holidays, and then the meetings pick up again in January. And we have two more, which is all we would have time to have because the state is going to need the final grand list on the 15th. But we're scheduled for the fourth and the eleventh. Um, the um, so yeah, I mean uh, Sherman is in. We're waiting on Wilner. I have most of the draft. And Zorzi. And Zorzi, thank you. And Zorzi, and I think we're about ready to get in. Yeah. So I mean, you know, I like to give those folks. You know, give the morning no later than Monday. So if it's going to be a little bit anyways, maybe it just makes sense to stick with the schedule and wait until January. I, don't know, whatever I think I, we could get you both. With it. I want to talk to um, you two about mm -hmm. Wilner briefly, um, but I, I think we could get them in for Monday if we wanted to. But, 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 I, so, but if we have time after, it makes sense. So yeah, we got, we'll have two meetings okay. after. We're not meeting on the 21st. Okay. Not as, not as now. That's it. Not meeting on the 21st or the 28th. <laughs> so next meeting is on the whatever is that? Um, Third, fourth, something like that? It's the fourth. <laughs> and since it's the first Monday, the meeting on the fourth will be at the high school. Or first oh. Thursday, sorry. Okay. Oh. We have me. With that, is everyone satisfied? All right. We, That's a big question. We are in. Oh, let me tell you all oh, one interesting thing about abatement, too. Okay, it's a the the full abatement board. It's bigger, so the quorum is bigger. It's much bigger. However, even this committee used to be bigger. <laughs> However, um, a majority of the city council. The treasurer and the assessor, if they're the only ones here, that makes a quorum too. Huh. So there's a little So they don't need any little breathing. <laughs> <laughs> they don't need us. Oh yes, yes, yes. So anyways, there's my little trivial tidbit for you. Okay, folks. We, as of 8.13, we are in recess. Oh, we're, we're going to be at the high school. We're not adjourned, Kim. We're in recess. All right. Five, ten,